All right, so today I'm going to teach something um, that is going to take this Sunday and next Sunday. And I want you to take that full gospel anointed hand and shake it like this so you know you're anointed. And I want you to say, instead of speaking all my mind, I'm going to mind my speech. And say that again. Instead of speaking all my mind, I'm going to start minding my speech because I don't want to be hung by my tongue. Amen. All right. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And a lot we can say that will glorify God if we don't say anything at all. Amen. I want to read to you, uh, this is uh, Luke 9, 51 through 55. When the days were approaching for his ascension, it was deter he determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers of, on ahead of him, and they went and entered the village of the Samaritans to plan for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. When his disciples came and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us as Sicilians to knock them out? Take them out. How dare they reject our Lord Jesus Christ? And he turned to them and rebuked them immediately and said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Now we see that Jesus' hand-picked men that were with him all this time in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, they still had murder in their heart. Now, they felt like it was justified murder because to take Jesus Christ and reject him, well, hey, you, you know, you brought this on yourself. You got that? See, there's something in us that justifies us reacting to anything that's evil or that we're not in agreement with. And the problem with that is it starts in your mind and your heart, but it comes out your mouth. And when it comes out its mouth, it's either being edifying or it's destructive. It either glorifies God or it doesn't. Now, the only reason Jesus Christ leaves us in the body on earth after we get saved, the only reason is to be a witness of his presence on the earth. And if there's one thing that causes people to not want to see the kingdom is knowing Christians that don't know when to shut their mouth up because they're no different than anybody else. Amen? Can't get any amens in this place right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right, so what we want to do is to learn what spirit are you of before you open your mouth? in reaction, you won't be able to restrain yourself once you start opening up and letting it go. So I want to keep repeating, instead of speaking all your mind, emotionalize words. How about you first check and discern what spirit are you of? Is this a loving Christian spirit or is this just out of the dregs of your heart. Now, the scripture says, do not be conformed to this world system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable when you open your mouth, does it glorify God would it be acceptable if Jesus was standing there? You see, if I was talking to Wayne about Alex, and I saw Alex coming, I would probably change the choice of words I have. His presence, I wouldn't want to say what I'm saying even if it was true, in his presence. Now, there's something wrong with our medulla oblongata, the brain stem. 
it must be something jammed up because we tell everybody we're spirit-filled. And then out of our mouth, we say all kinds of things about other people. We, are, we, we speak our emotional reaction, usually from a victim or from uh, our, our wonderful intelligence that we know everything. And somehow we get temporary amnesia that Jesus is right there or that we're filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Are you still here? Yeah. Now, I have said for about 45 years now, every time I preach, we need to practice the presence of the living Jesus Christ who said, I will never, ever leave you. Plus, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit himself who monitors all of our thoughts, life, all of our imaginations. Now, I think it's because we don't know our commission. We know our invitation and in, in our reservations in heaven when we die. But we don't know about our commission is to represent the kingdom of God. Now, I'm believing that... that, that Glenn is going to go out and not just represent White Dove Fellowship, not just his family, but he'll represent the kingdom of God. Yeah. All right? So we are in the world, but we're not of the world. So if we're in the world, we shouldn't react to the world as the world reacts. There should be something distinctively different. Paul said this way, if you act just like everybody else, you're just a mere human being that's as lost as anybody else, even though you still go to church. He says, why? Because you may be saved, but you're not a witness of the kingdom. And you're not a witness of the kingdom because in your inner heart, you're not considering the kingdom. And if you're not denying self, then you're actually denying Christ. Is that right? All right. So as we move on like a herd of turtles, I commission to the church is that the church is the visible evidence and proof of God's invisible kingdom. He said in John 13, 35, the witness is going to be how you love one another. Now, if you love one another unconditionally, then everything that comes out of your mouth about that person or to that person or to another person about you ought to be unconditional love that edifies, it doesn't break down. And as we say over and over again, and my, my disciple says over and over again, you want to be on the building crew, not the wrecking crew. And it all comes out, are your words edifying? Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good for the use of edifying the hearers, not even the person you're talking to, the people who hear you. Is light coming out of your mouth or is darkness coming out of your mouth? Is life coming or death? Is it edifying? Is it destructive? Because that is the main witness of our life. We are known by our words. We are known by our speech. Is that right? Okay, so our command is go out into the world as sheep surrounded by ravenous wolves. Be as harmless as a dove that can't compete with the predators, but also be wise as a serpent. And we'll get to that. So we're gonna, it's going to take me this Sunday and next Sunday because there's so many scriptures I wanted to use because I, when I preach, I'd rather use the word of God than the words of Mike. So we need to be seeking our new normal, which is from now on we need to be harmless as doves and wise as serpents. Why? Because God said that's how people will ask of the hope that they see in you. So the only way we can do that is to decide that our new normal, not because of COVID, 
but because of the cross. I knew normal needs to be, I need to watch my mouth. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if it sounds anti-Christ, that's the kind of heart we have because we haven't renewed it on the word. Now, how many people recognize you live with a whole bunch of people that provoke the living hell out of you? And the problem is they have your DNA. I submit you today, you have never been as angry at the devil as you have kinfolk. I, I bet you have never raised your voice in anger at the devil as you have as someone that's in your own household. Think about that. I don't want to think about it. Raise the hands together. Say with me, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now understand a right spirit is not a spirit. It's attitude. That means attitude. Now what's important about attitude, attitude determines your altitude in God's kingdom. God does not elevate. He does not promote somebody with a stinking attitude. He allows that attitude to torment them so that they would wake up and smell the coffee. I need to repent. This ain't working for me. Right. Understand that? Amen. Now, when we repent, God says, okay, we start all brand new. You have no record. You have no reason to hold you back. Now, if you do my will, you will be promoted. Promotion comes in the form of supernatural blessings that you can't not attain any other way. I'm going to take two weeks to talk about that, but I'm just throwing a seed out here. So Jesus was our example. Now, if Jesus is our example, understand, in Acts 10.38, Jesus went about doing good. His anointing was to do good. Your anointing is to do good. Amen. Not everybody's good. Matter of fact, none are good. Amen. Right? right? The only good most people do is to manipulate something that's a betterment for their own life. That's, their, that's what they call good. Okay. A waiter doesn't need to know your name. He's going to smile and be courteous. Why? He wants a tip. Got that? All right. So we usually do good to other people based on what's going to be good for us in return. So that's why God said there's none good because God's goodness is I got pay. I love you no matter how you take it. You either react to it, you don't like it, you don't want to love me back. Because it's a one-way sign. Agape is love one way regardless of how somebody receives it or rejects it. Our love is reciprocal. I'm going to love you until you don't love me back. Then I'm going to move on to fresh real estate until I get a, a keeper. See. So I'm going to love you on probation until you come up to my standard. If not, we got the, you know, somebody, there's another candidate somewhere. All right, so God's saying it is better if as God's will to suffer doing good than the consequence of doing evil. suffer for doing good because most of the time we have a good attitude about blessing somebody but when they don't appreciate it we don't feel so good about it anymore 
where God's saying whether they persecute you or not in your goodness, it's better to suffer for doing good as representing the kingdom than to get resentful and sh cut them out of your life and go tell five or six other people how no good and ungrateful they are. I'm just saying that's possible. I didn't say any of y'all ever did something like that. I read this in the National Geographic that some people do this. Now, God wants our new nature, our new normal to be that we are harmless as doves, harmless sheep surrounded by ravenous wolves, and wise as a snake. Is that right? Okay, now what he says is, in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All right, now watch, let's look at this. We usually don't like evil, so we react to it, thinking we have some way we're going to deal with that evil, that evil stuff. Okay. When that happens is we remove ourselves from what God wants us to do because we feel like, again, they deserve it. We want, we want to be a champion. We want to right wrongs. And we use our mouth to do that. But our attitude and our motive is wrong. So God did not create us for evil, but he created us to do good regardless of the immediate outcome. Almost all of us do things based on imagined preferred outcome. In the spirit, you're not allowed to judge the outcome. And if he lets you know the outcome, you probably wouldn't do the good. Does somebody understand that? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, now why? Well, we are designed to suffer for Christ. Nobody says, oh, Lord Jesus Christ, I love you. This is my prayer request. Please let me suffer for, for you. <laughs> All of our prayers is to avoid suffering including traffic, we, we, you know, just anything. We don't, we don't, man, we don't, we don't want no trouble. Right. Problem is the kingdom says you enter into the kingdom through much trouble. Right. And we are outside the kingdom because we don't want to go through much trouble. Right. So we gripe about everything. Maybe y'all don't. But. So God did not intend for us to be reactive, but to be to overcome evil by doing good. We got that? All right. Now let, let me let me help you, because we're all wonderful people who who don't do anything wrong, and we've been saved from the world system. The wolves that he tells us that he's putting us in are people of our own household. A better word is our oikos, because not everybody is related to us, but we have friends and people that we have in our life, in our circle. There are billions of people on the earth, but they're not in our life. We know they're there, but we, they're not in our immediate life. So the wolves are going to be people who don't discipline their mouth. They're catty, they're unkind, they're judgmental, they're critical, they can, they, they can be accusatory. And the problem is we react to that. All right. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Not all men are wonderful. And there's a pretty a few no good women too. Okay. <laughs> Beloved, do not. 
You see, when everybody else laughs, that's one thing. When you laugh, I start laughing for some reason. I don't know. I need a straight man, okay? Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Now, last week I spoke. Since we have people in our life, there's nothing we can do. He won't let us get rid of them. He won't let, he, 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 we have to just live with them. Why? People are necessary to remind us that we have a fallen nature. Nobody gets you to come in contact with your fallen nature like the people that you have in your life. Why does God want to do that? So that all day long we recognize how great his grace and mercy towards us is. If you with somebody say, thank you for being my life. I, I needed you to remind me, you know. <laughs> See, you're my reminder. You remind me that I, that I, I, I just, I, you know, my God, without Christ, what would I be, right? Because look what I am with Christ. So last week I said, because people provoke us and do us wrong and betray us and accuse us and criticize us and shame us, even if it's behind our back and somebody else tells us what they said, we're offended, right? So what happens is, I preached last week, let's stop seeking, asking God to revenge us, and how about we start desiring for God to vindicate us? So instead of needing to get revenge, I give God the revenge because he says it's his. But now I have an opportunity for supernatural vindication in the form of promotion. Understand. Houses you didn't have to mortgage, wells you didn't have to dig, orchards you didn't have to plant, and then... And then Matthew 6.33, everything that everybody else max out their credit cards and works overtime to get, he said, it will come to you. But that only comes when we obey the command. Amen. Now, don't wave your hand until I say this, but I'm going to want you to wave your hand at me. If somebody comes to mind that knows where your last nerve is. There's somebody that knows where you keep your goat. Somebody easily provokes you. Yeah, well, in your case, I know who it is. <laughs> now, how many people know inside your household, Jesus said, your enemies shall be those of your own household because there ain't nobody that can send you up the wall like somebody close to you. Amen. Now, he wasn't saying that your enemies like the Ukraines and the Russians. He's talking about people that keep you distracted from the kingdom that you pay more attention to them emotionalized in your imagination than you do the presence of the living Christ. Amen. And you spend more time in resentment and anger and planning what you'd like to, you wish would happen to them, and what you'd like to tell them and how you could avoid them and you wish it wouldn't happen than you do honoring and praising the Lord. In other words, when they or not around, they're in your gut so bad, their presence is always there. And the presence of the Lord seems strangely distant. So the commission, take that Pentecostal hand, that Holy Ghost hand, and say, Lord, I accept the commission. All right, let's talk about the commission. Here it is, 10, Matthew 10, uh, 16, behold, I send you out like harmless sheep in the midst 
of a pack of bloodthirsty predator wolves. And I want you to be as harmless as a dove and as wise as a serpent. Now, Lord, I thought you loved me. I do love you. And you're going to send me out there? I can't take my gun. I can't take a knife. I can't take a baseball bat. You send me out there. I don't have fangs. I don't have claws. And you send me out. And you, you can send me out in a whole pack of ravenous wolves. Yes. The Greek word apostello is I send you forth. It's the word we use for apostle. In other words, everybody who is born again is a sent one. He says, as the Father sent me, now I send you out. And the world that he sends you out is your household. Your oikos. The one secretary where you work that, that just nauseates you just to hear you. Her, she is just a pain in everybody's side. Why they don't fire her, you don't know. She makes work miserable. She's in your oikos. She is planted by the Lord Jesus Christ to let you know, don't stick a fork in you. You're not done yet. You're very much alive. Now, is he doing that to torment us? No, he's doing it so we have an awareness of how great the grace is. And an opportunity for us to repent. All right, so we really all have an apostolic commission to go out into our families. Now, why is that important? Here's the good part. He wants to take at least one person in every household, get them saved as a Joseph, supernaturally raise them up so that that light goes to the whole household, so that that one person in that household is so supernaturally elevated that the other people either see the light and repent or they, they judge themselves by rejecting that light. But to get you from here to there, that kind of promotion only comes supernaturally by acts of the Lord. Follow that? Now, here's the good. If you don't want to be that person... Well, you won't have any supernatural provision and exaltation and promotion from the Lord. It'll have to be by the sweat of your brow and your own ingenuity and just plain old natural luck or something. And you just have to do, understand the way of the transgressor is hard. Now, here's another thing. You enter into the kingdom of God where all the supply is through much trouble. And the trouble will be people in your life that if they weren't in your life, seemingly your life would be so much better. Murder in your heart is you don't poison them. You can't stab them. You can't shoot them. You can't pay some mafia boss to take them out. In your case, murder is wishing they were not in your life. Well, God allows them to be in your life so that in your weakness not to be able to destroy them or put them out of your life, his power is made strong because your witness only grows greater. So Jesus said to them, peace I give to you, not peace like the world has. You take a two-year-old toddler who keeps trying to grab something on the table, the coffee table, and you can't, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't touch that. And he pitches a fit and he cries until he won't stop crying, he's turning blue. So then you take the thing that he wanted and you give it to him to shut him up and he has peace. But he got peace because what he wanted, even if it was wrong, he got. So the world gets peace by smoking crack and 
making money or whatever they need to do or revenging or whatever they do. But it's, that's not the kind of peace. God wants us to have the peace that passes natural understanding because we exchange reacting to the world by having a love relationship with the present Christ. An example is Peter locked up in the prison knowing at 6 o'clock the next morning he's going to have his head cut off in the public. But when that church prayed, an angel, physical angel, goes there and has to shove him and wake him up. He's so, he's so at peace, he, he, the, the angel can't wake him up. I don't know about you, but if I thought I was going to have a bad day tomorrow, I'd have a hard time going to bed. All right, raise those hands. Lord, we want peace that passes natural understanding and joy that is intoxicating. Now watch. In his presence, not in West Wego, not in the parish, not in the trial boat, not in the trip. No, in his presence, not only is the fullness of joy, but provision evermore that comes to you, the kingdom of God. But we have to exchange our right to straighten out everybody to allow the Lord to straighten out us on what spirit we're really of. Now, all of us in this church, I suspect, are full of the Holy Ghost and other things. Amen. You fill in the blank yourself. He sends us out as sheep. Again, they don't have fangs. They don't have, they can't do it. Do you know when you say, we're going to cast the devil out? That's a shepherd's word because when, the, when a shepherd has a sheep that keeps running away, he runs up, he grabs it by his back legs, and he flips it on his back. If a sheep is trying to climb a hill and falls and on his back, he's cast out. He can't move. He can't. So when you cast the devil out, you're putting him in a position where he can't move. Okay. But a sheep is so defensive, if you get him on the black back, he's going to die with his feet in the air. He can't do anything about it. Because of the wool, if he gets in a briar patch, he can't, he's stuck. They can't defend themselves. Okay, now watch. Why would God send us out that he loves so much? Why would he send us out into, why would he do that? Well, because the sheep's greatest wisdom is to stay close to the presence of the shepherd. That all the wolves in the world can't get to him as long as he's butt up against the shepherd. Our problem is we don't, we're not, we don't stay in the presence of Jesus. We get more mindful in the presence of the people we don't like than enjoying the presence of the king. Now, here's the second thing why sheep can have wisdom. They listen to the shepherd. Our problem is we move away from the shepherd and we don't listen. And then we get our bowels so much in the uproar, it vomits out of our mouth. And because we're afraid to really go attack our antagonists, we go to four about other people and tell them how no good he is. So we know sheep are completely defensive against ravenous predators. Now think about this. A sheep can do nothing to defend itself, certainly in the presence of the wo a, a pack of, of wolves. He can't bite, he can't claw, can't run fast. So when you have an inability, a word for that is weakness. Now watch. Why would God do that to us? Well, number one, he doesn't send us out by ourselves. He goes with us. Why? 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if I'm surrounded by wolves, I know the presence of Christ is there. Is that right? Now watch. Well, I can't defend myself. That glorifies God. How? In my weakness, his power is made strong, and his power will be some form of supernatural act. Let me tell you how I know this. I, 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 I was a, the counselor, uh, the counseling pastor at First Assembly. We had 6,000 people at that church at that time. And uh, I'm in my office one day, and I have my head down, and I'm writing. And this man comes charging in my office, and he grabs me by the back of the neck and pushes my head down. He says, when I finish beating you up, I'm going to your house. I'm going to burn your house down with your wife and your kids in it. Just like that. I didn't know who he was. So I had my head down. And I said, Lord, you're going to have to do something. I didn't know what was going to happen. And, and the Lord uh, instructed me to do this. I put my hook. I said, you're an empty paper bag. And the guy collapsed on the floor, went around, pulled the checkbook out, and wrote an offering check right in front of my eyes, and then walked out the door. Now, that is supernatural. Amen. Now, as I'm saying you're an empty paper bag, it sounds awfully stupid to me to say that to a guy who's there to kill me, okay? That was a word of wisdom that made no sense, but it created a supernatural act. Now, when we had the church, I started the church over there on General de Gaulle at the old Western Auto Building, and we were in there, and... It had a big, General de Gaulle is here, there's a big parking lot, asphalt parking lot, and then the, the, since it was a storefront, it was all glass, and the phone rings, I'm there with, with uh, Raymond, and it's just he and I there, and the phone rings, I picked up the phone, and the guy says, hey, this is a, uh, I forget his first name, but his last name, this is Rapolo, uh, you were counseling my wife against me and all that kind of, are you there? I said, yeah. So he says, I'm coming right there. I'm coming over there to get you right now. So I told Raymond, I said, go in the back, and if this guy starts beating me up, call the police, okay? So I stood there, and I heard, sound like a Rockford movie, uh, television show, screaming tired. He fishtailed that truck over. He was a Vietnam veteran, had a big old beard. He jumps out the truck. He comes in. Are you Mike Millet? I said, yes. And he goes, I'll hit it. And, I, and, and the Lord had me. I put my hands out. I said, you want life or you want death? He slapped my hand. I want life. He collapsed on the floor, led him to the Lord. He wound up buying a blue White Dove Fellowship t-shirt, went out, and, and uh, several weeks of later, when they were in the church, he became our Royal Ranger leader in the church. Now, here, listen again. I wanted to shoot him. Anybody understand that? I wanted to defend myself. Now, because of that supernatural, he, and he wound up dying at a heart attack, uh, attack and I prayed with him uh, right before he died in the hospital. So I know he's in heaven. My point is, what you want is, you want promotion to come from the Lord so that you don't manipulate everything. But the supernatural elevation can't happen unless in your weakness you allow God to do something that shows his power. But what we do is, we don't do that. We just run our mouth. Amen. At least I do. Now, does everybody understand you have a mind and you have a heart, that's your soul, and you have a body. Once you get born again, you have a spirit that's supposed to be the king over the kingdom of your life. So we should take orders from the spirit. My spirit gets tired of saying, shut up, Mike. Just shut up. It's like my spirit's worn out. You understand that? Just don't speak. Jesus said, choose your words widely. Say yes, say no, because in an abundance of, word, of words, sin is very evident. What is sin? Ignoring the presence of Christ and taking my life back.
and feel invalidated, I have a right to be resentful and bitter or blow the whistle on you for being no good. But what happens is, the Lord says, okay, you're happy with that, but that's it. Stay where you are. Go around the mountain one more time. But there's no supernatural elevation. So he puts us in a situation where we have this great commission, but it's an impossible mission because it's not possible for me to always be wonderful. Now, I know everybody here thinks I'm wonderful all the time, but don't ask Elaine. All right. Okay. Jesus said, my grace is sufficient. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, think what Paul's saying. Paul was to the point where, and, and I've been doing this quite a bit, where I've been teaching people, if you name it, you can tame it. So if somebody's really uh, doing me wrong, instead of feeling like a victim, I start thanking God for the privilege to identify with the sufferings of Christ with the bonus of being able to be glorified with him. Follow that. So when you start saying, man, that guy don't give me nothing but hell. Say, so, you know, this guy's given me an opportunity to identify with Christ that I might be glorified with him. Do you understand that? Now, Paul, he was way ahead of me, as you might guess, and he said, I'm asking God that if he left out anything in his body suffering on the cross, I would like to, to make that up, and I, I don't take that course. At least I'm not ready to sign up. I didn't even sign up for that one. Yeah. I'm still dealing with traffic. Yeah, I'm, I'm just dealing with traffic. Somebody pulled in front of me and almost wrecked me. I, the imagination I have in that second, hoping he flips around. Because yeah. he deserves it. Why? He got in front of me. And you know who I was? How dare you get in front of me? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am made strong because in my weakness, the power of God can rest upon me. But that's a commission you have to accept. Because if not, everything seems unfair. Now put that Pentecostal hand up, let it, let it shake and say, I accept. I accept. It's, never fair, it's never fair, but it is just. It is just. just because... That's how he wants it to be. Okay, you understand that? Because he is God and I am not. I don't even belong to me. I don't, my life is not mine. And I've always got my bowels in order, but he doesn't appreciate it. Look what he's doing, his, what he bought. Nothing happens without him knowing and being in control. And he goes, I said, why do you let this happen to me? Because I want to bless you. I don't want to be that blessed. I want you to be blessed as a witness, so I'm going to bless you supernaturally. So we have had some betrayal, some accusations, some some things that happen to us, and almost every time it really, it really, really was painful. We look at each other and say, we, we're about to get blessed. Why? You enter into the kingdom through much trouble, and God promises houses, lands, provision, supernaturally, and the last two words, with persecutions. 
So now if you're persecuted, start expecting some supernatural blessing that's greater than you could imagine. But as long as you withdraw yourself from that, well, you just see yourself as a victim or you see yourself better than everyone else. So now you've moved from relationship with Christ to religion. So our emotional weakness requires God's power in our life because we can't take, we just, I can't take no more. You ever say, I'm on my last nerve? I'd, I'd, I'd kill myself, but I used to be Catholic, and I ain't sure about that. You know, I, I don't know. That might be a bad choice. <laughs> so here's the deal. Who and how would you be without his abiding grace in your life? So what we have to do is say, I, I need more grace. Well, how do I get more grace? Humble yourself. Big way to start is shut up. Quit running your mouth. Amen. Quit whining and complaining. Quit telling everybody about how hard it is and what everybody has done you wrong. All right, you ready? Say with me. Oh, oh. what needless pain I often bear all because I refuse to take it all to the Lord in prayer. As I issue right there. I'd rather take it to you and tell you how no good everybody is and what they did little old Mike. And you know Mike. Mike don't deserve this. I'm a good person. I don't hurt nobody. He won't let me. I'm sending you out like Sheep among wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, I know we talked about this a lot, but why would he want you to be a snake? A snake has a mouth full of poison. But God gave a snake a tongue that is constantly tasting the environment. And the snake doesn't need his eyes or his nose. He just needs to discern the immediate environment. Now, why is the environment important? Because the atmosphere determines the environment. If the wicked one is in the atmosphere, then no good thing can happen in that environment. Environment determines what prospers and what, what dies. So when you go into a restaurant or you're in front of somebody's house or people walk up, you should test by discerning the environment. That lets you know if it's the Holy Ghost or an evil ghost that's in control. You let that vex you and you remove yourself from that rather than opening your mouth, rather than biting somebody, sarcasm, self-defense. You pull back. You could hurt them, but you don't. So he says, serpents only bite when they have no other recourse. They'd rather slither away as a peacemaker. Now, what I learned, you heard this before, when I get, when somebody's really antagonizing me, I say, excuse me a minute, and I back up, and I have learned to count to, ten, to tongues uh, count in tongues to ten to calm myself down. Shando, Kado, Rando, Sherebe, Karaba. And by that time, you know, I get my spirit back and I decide, excuse me, gotta go. And I withdraw myself like a wise serpent rather than getting in an argument and having a bad witness. Understand that? Now that's a discipline, and you have to already have that in your mind before you get engaged. Because once you're engaged, your emotions take over, and then and nothing's going to stop you. Amen. And it's called escalation. So we accept our commission to be witnesses for Christ because we're commanded 
to be homeless as a dove while under attack. Mike and Elaine have adopted a thing that when we're going to, to even relatives or friends' houses, church people houses, when we get there, we, we commit it to the Lord and we say, put a, a guard on my ear and a check on my lips. Don't let us hear anything that's going to damage us spiritually. And for God's sake, don't let us say anything that's going to ruin the witness. There's a reason for discipleship is to discipline yourself. Amen. Say yes, say no, but when you start vomiting out all your emotions somewhere, it's not a witness for Christ. And if Christ would materialize and manifest himself, you'd be trying to eat those words back. Amen. Now here's the problem. The Bible says in the New Testament that when we stand before him naked with no, no, no attorney, no no husband, no wife, you're standing there before the Lord, he's going to ask you to give an account of the words that came out of your mouth because words are spirit. Now, here's the good part. He says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one that loves me. That's just how we show the love of God is keeping his commandments. The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and reveal myself to them. Now, how does he reveal himself? Through supernatural acts of promotion. Amen. Faith to faith, glory to glory, levels of life. Remember, we all live in seasons and levels. We all go through the same seasons, but we do it on different levels. And you want God to constantly promote you to another level. So you learn to avoid conflict with chosen words. Follow that? Jesus was a master. If somebody said, I think you're an idiot, Jesus would, Jesus would say, you think I'm an idiot? Yeah, I think you're crazy. You think I'm crazy? He would match the words. They had no, you know, eventually ping, playing ping pong is over. It doesn't escalate it. It causes the person to start thinking, what the heck am I doing? Amen. So the, you never say anything but what they said. They go, well, I can't believe you said that. Well, you said it. You need to just say it back to them. It takes discipline to do that, but after a while, you start enjoying it. <laughs> 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 I got this guy by the throat. He doesn't even know. Okay. <laughs> now, here's the bit. When a man's ways pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. When a man, You see, because that person is not in control. The Lord is in control. And it, it's, it's upsetting as it seems like, He's developed, I told some, some of our COPs that I was with the other day, it's not even about keeping all the rules. It's about developing the character of Christ. See? When you realize our job description when we got saved is to become less like us and more like Christ, where we must decrease and he must increase. And so we're known by our words. Now, our provokers expose true fallen character. Consider that God has lovingly ministered truth. Like I love Brother Wayne. Brother Wayne and I are very, very close. I, I, I call him a real close friend. But, I, you know, I, 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 I think that there's times when Tory lovingly, through God, allows him to see some of his fallen nature. <laughs> it's just a guess. Good guess. Now, God has chosen truck drivers in my life. <laughs> See, I'm singing praises to the Lord until, you know, I'm stuck behind a truck. We were trying to get to, uh, up north, and, and there were two truck drivers decided that all the way they were going to go 40 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. 
and we were just behind them like this long train, and I mean, we rode forever. And I want you to know, I did not ask God one time to bless his generations. <laughs> <laughs> if any other, anybody understand what I'm saying? Okay. So God only wants us to value the grace and mercy that he's given us. So he allows us to discover what we're really like. Now, thank God he takes what we're really like and hides it in Jesus so that Father God can't see it. Now, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. In, in the Greek, it says insanely sick because it's the opposite of the mind of Christ. Who can understand it? Well, we can't. We don't, even, you know, we don't understand what comes out. You ever have to say, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I thought that. So, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind and the secret motives. I will give all people that do rewards either negatively or positively. Because remember, everything comes out of our mouth, the fruit of our mouth. Our words are seeds that produce fruit, good or bad. Now, I wrote, who really knows their own heart? Then I wrote in parentheses, who would really want to know it? Now, it's like the little boy was outside and somebody told him something. He ran inside. His dad was on a sofa eating potato chips, drinking a beer, and watching the saints. And he said, Dad, Dad, I need to ask you a question. He said, Son, 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 go in the other room and ask your mother. He said, Dad, I didn't want to know that much about it. <laughs> you got that? All right. So God says, I'm going to show you your heart. No, it's all right. I got it. I don't want to know that much about myself, Lord. So he, he, he keeps it hidden because we would literally sabotage ourselves. Now, I'm schooled in, uh, in, in, in uh, credentialed in suicide prevention, and people commit suicide when they discover their own heart. It's not about they don't kill themselves because other people they have no reason to live once they discover who they really are. Follow that? Now, for us, we shouldn't commit suicide, but we should reckon ourselves as dead, but alive to Christ. When I take the bait and I react to a provoker, I have risen from death, jerked my life back from Christ, and exalted my own life, and now I get in trouble. All right. Now, remember, Br'er Rabbit in the briar patch. Br'er Fox wanted to eat him, but he couldn't catch him. So Br'er Fox found a tar pit. So he took the tar and he molded it into the tar baby. He put a straw hat on it, a pipe. He put some pebbles in there, and he put it at the crossroad. And Br'er Rabbit come down the bunny trail. And when he passed the tar baby, he said, good morning. And tar baby ain't saying nothing. So he turned around and said, I said, I said, good morning. Tar baby ain't said nothing. He went back, he said, let me tell you something. You don't tell me good morning, I'm going to slap you upside the head. So he slapped him. He said, you don't let go of my arm, I'm going to slap He slapped him again. He said, I'm going to kick your guts. And he kicked him. Here's his you got tall babies all over your life, and some of them have your DNA. Pass on by. Amen. Don't slap the tall baby. You got your super glue? You slap the tall baby, you're going to be stuck in that thing. You'll live in regret. Keep your mouth shut. Amen. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Now listen to this. I'm going to close with this one. To you who are willing to listen. You know what that means? God said, I'm going to speak, but you're not listening. But to those who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. So quit using your prayer time to malign these people. Why don't you listen to me? Because a harmless sheep has to be listening to the shepherd. The shepherd doesn't just listen to the sheep. My dad was Sicilian. He kept those customs. And he would, he, he said, in the morning, the son says good morning to the father. The father doesn't say good morning to the son. You recognize I was here before you. God was here before us. So we take all of our hurts to the Lord in prayer. And when you pass that test, when you're willing to do it, you're going to see supernatural advancement in your life. If not, you're going to go around, around the circle over and over again. Let's all stand together.